And our third speaker is Mr. Alex Weish. He's former Minister of, for Communications and Natural Resources. He's been mentioned in many talks so far today and looking forward to hearing his contributions now. Thank you, Alex. Thanks very much, um, Eveen. And it's great to be here um, and to contribute to this really interesting and stimulating uh, conference. And uh, congratulations to the Department of Foreign Affairs and to colleagues in the uh, Institute of uh, European and Inter International European Affairs for putting together the stellar uh, cast of speakers and facilitating uh, through evening this the really important discussion uh, that we've had. And actually, where I want to pick up, I'm slightly out of sequence, I think, in terms of the speakers. Because, I, well, first of all, I don't have any slides because I'm a lawyer and I don't understand slides. But secondly, that's a joke. Um, but secondly, I'm kind of, I don't have facts really to impart to you, important and compelling uh, and critically, uh, critical facts. I just, I just have a few opinions I'm going to throw out actually on the basis of my own experience as a politician and just to uh, explore a little bit the kind of broader public opinion context and political context, very much picking up on some of the points that um, our Danish colleague has just made about the broader context that we need to have in order to make all of these advances or many of these advances that we know and we appreciate, people in this room appreciate, are so important uh, in, into the future. And, you know, I've had an opportunity, and I heard uh, Richard, uh, Minister, earlier on uh, reflecting on his role and uh, Really, even in the short few years since I was doing the job that he is now doing, I think there's been an enormous change. And I think it's been a very encouraging change in the context in which the context that I want to address. And that is the, the preparedness of public opinion to engage with uh, these subjects, the level of information, the standard of debate. It's not always brilliant, but it's a lot better than it was three to five years ago. And in this country, of course, we were coming out then of a, of a very, coming out of a very severe economic crisis. Nobody really wanted to talk about anything else apart from tidying up and sorting out the dreadful banking collapse that we had and the uh, economic and the consequences that, they, that that collapse had for so many people, families, businesses and so on in the country. So the context has changed. And actually, I was just noticed yesterday Kevin O'Sullivan in the Irish Times when he was describing, writing a piece yesterday about the our emissions record, which, as you'll know, is not good. And he just, to characterise the problem for Ireland that we need to address, just in the following sentence, and I thought it was pithy and correct, and I quote, a booming economy, poor public transport infrastructure, a rapidly expanding dairy sector, and housing stock that largely is not energy efficient, add up to a distinctly Irish emissions problem, unquote. It's just one sentence, but it's pretty good, I think, if we want to just put ourselves in the picture of where we are. Each of those components, I think, that he touched on is true, but how do we actually make the progress? And more importantly, from my perspective, how do we uh, take advantage of the evolving, the encouraging public opinion that's there and actually take it on to a new level? And I've said before that I think that the Citizens' Assembly that we had in this country that dealt with the issue of climate change had an enormous impact. I, mean, I remember when I was doing, and I, I'm a, a Democrat, right, as, as everybody in this room is, I'm sure, believe in democratic deliberation, believe that we make decisions that, through a democratic system of electing people to parliament, uh, hearing all the information, for obviously forming your government, making decisions, and having democratic accountability for them. But the interesting thing about the Citizens' Assembly was, and it was quite a contrast to the experience that I had in the Dáil, which, for which I have enormous respect. Buttons are no buttons. Voting buttons are not. I have huge respect for. And I think we should have respect for our parliamentary system. But I remember when we were talking about energy and decarbonisation in 2015, doing a white paper, most of the political people that I was looking at across the room of all parties we're preoccupied, okay, I mentioned the, the economic thing, but we're preoccupied about wind farms, local objections, um, issues that were, of course, legitimate for politicians. But it was awfully hard to get politicians of all parties, I don't excuse my own party or any party, to get just to, to try to elevate the thing beyond the immediate localism that, we, that characterizes so much of our politics. And I think the Citizens' Assembly did an awful lot because it was a group, maybe people, not very much more than the number of people in this room, randomly selected. Okay, they're not elected. You can have your 
issues about how it was put together I and mean, can you have democracy by you know, random selection. But they were able to deliberate on these issues, to listen to people like we have in the panels today and debate, ask them questions, debate those issues, understand them a lot better and then come up with an absolutely terrific report that then motivated the political system to move forward in, 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 in a really rapid way in the, in, the, in, in the more recent period. So I'm interested in how do we mobilize public opinion based on that kind of a model. And I'm really delighted that the Climate Action Plan does talk about a new, uh, you know, a new model of citizen engagement. It's something that we tried to push when we were doing that white paper. How do we deepen that sense of, of engagement? And, you know, we had a process in this country, and I, I'm very interested in Denmark, because I always think Denmark is a sort of a negotiated economy and a negotiated society. And things maybe happen frustratingly slowly sometimes in Denmark, but they happen. Because they believe in reaching, as I understand it, and I was there as a minister, and I was there as a, a student more years ago than I care to remember. And I, I very much admire Denmark and what they've achieved. But the broader political context, and thank you for saying that, it's not just a technical, technocratic question. It's also the broader political context. And politicians respond to public opinion. So we need to work on, can we deepen this even more, this level of public engagement? And we had social dialogue in this country on you know, pay issues, um, uh, conditions in employment, so come up to about six, seven years ago, and it sort of collapsed around the time of the economic collapse. And IBEC, which is our employer's body, have advocated very, very clearly in their statement earlier this year that we should have a return to social dialogue to address this issue. You might be surprised that that demand has come from the employer side, that we should restore social dialogue. And I think they're right about that. Because until we have this ongoing uh, engagement between, um, uh, between business, as you said, business, uh, workers who may, be called, who may lose their jobs or may have to think about new ways of, of uh, uh, um, uh, earning a living, frankly. We think of the peak stations, we think of Money Point, all of the changes that are coming that have to come. We need to have this consensus. And I also think that political parties have to really, you know, up their game in terms of their understanding of this question. What's often said to me, again, I'd, and I don't excuse my own party, but I'm sure other parties are not much different. There's a language issue, even. If you take the word environment, or the, the, the notion of the environment, people often say to me, I remember, you know, when, even when I was running the European elections, people, oh yes, the environment, very important, Alex. Very, very important. And we, we really, in, in this party, I'm in the Labour Party, right, we need to increase, we, environment's very important and Greens are doing very well. We need to really, we need to be better on that issue of the environment. Now that, of course, is true, but it totally understates the problem, the issue. It isn't just a question about the environment. It's a question about the economy. The adjustments that we need to make are of such magnitude that we, if our economies right across the world on, on one view, should be unrecognisable in 10 years' time if we're to do the right thing. It's a complete economic adjustment, not just a kind of a, let's do more for the environment, quote-unquote. So I think th that's another... Structures within government. I mean, OK, I, I don't, don't... I'm not answering to anybody today, so I can say, and I know we're on the record, I can say what, what, what I feel is, is right. I mean, we, we've two agriculture departments in this country, two rural departments... Department of Agriculture, Department of Rural and Community Affairs, I've forgotten the exact title of it. We have a Department of Transport in, in, a, in, a, in a sector that's heavily regulated anyway. The Minister for Transport should be the Minister for Decarbonising Transport. The Minister for Agriculture should be the Minister for the Reform of Agriculture in the context of climate change. You know, these are big issues for how we structure. I look at the European Union, Franz Timmermans, for whom I have huge admiration. He's now uh, been asked to deal with the Green New Deal, which is fantastic. And there's nobody better that could be, I think, that could be doing that. I would say that, wouldn't I? But then I look at some of the other decisions in relation to the other uh, commissioner positions, and I wonder, how is he really genuinely going to have the clout and the ability, I know he's very senior, to... Uh, reach into all of the elements of the economies right across Europe in order to bring about real change. This silo thing again. It's, you see it in government here. You even see it in the Commission. 
So structures of government, structures of governance, we have to actually address all of those things. And the final point I would just make, you know, the new model of social of citizen engagement, call it what you want, social dialogue, changing our structures of government, political parties waking up to the sheer magnitude of this. But the language needs to be a language of opportunity. We've come out of a crisis, an economic crisis of 10 years. Everybody's writing about populism. Everybody's worried about populism, rightly so, in terms of many of the decisions that maybe were made during the crash, all of the austerity, all of that debate and so on. For me, this is an opportunity to rehabilitate the state, to rehabilitate the great progressive opportunity that the state is, in my mind, and the state can be. It's also an opportunity, frankly, to rehabilitate the European Union to give leadership on these questions so that we, you know, don't go back to this notion of getting, you know, let's get the state out of our lives, let's remove, get rid of regulation, red tape, all of this, that sort of narrative that's always there. Stand up for a strong uh, state, stand up for a strong commission, st uh, strong European Union, and stand up for a real green uh, new deal, a real green new deal that can actually bring about change right across the world. Thank you very much.